Hey, I'm Narb Makes, and I've been wanting to make a miniature enchanted forest for a while now. So when this week's sponsor reached out to me with these crazy detailed miniatures, I knew I had to finally tackle this project. My first stop was at the dollar store, where I picked up a bag full of plastic plants and shrubbery. These are going to be making up some of the forest undergrowth and bushes around my trees. So I took some time to clip them and organize them based on size and appearance, making sure to only select plants that would look good in miniature form. In the past, I've used store-bought laser-cut plants and ferns, and I keep saying I want to try making my own, so here we go. After designing some ferns and other greenery, I set to cutting them out of some black poster board. Mostly so it'd be really hard to film what I'm doing. Look at that, once we pop them out, we have little tiny ferns that we can shape and glue down wherever we want. One downside to these is they're a bit fragile and can rip off rather easily. To remedy that, I decided to try another thing I haven't really done before, and that's acid etching some brass. I cut out a small tester piece and I set about flattening it and spray painted it outside. The color here doesn't really matter much, but it should be something dark for the next step. The basic idea for etching is you want to develop some sort of resist. It's a fancy way of saying something to block the acid in parts of the brass. You could do this with toner paper, markers, masking tape, etc, etc. If you have a laser engraver, you can actually just laser engrave away the spray paint in parts that you want the acid to cut. The laser is too weak to actually cut into the brass, but it cleans away the paint just fine. To hold the ferric chloride, we're going to be using a plastic container that has a small tube pumping air from the bottom of this holder. This agitates the solution and speeds up the process by a lot. Now, ferric chloride is a mild acid, but wearing gloves saves me a bit of a mess and cleaning it off later. There's not much to look at while it's going, and it should be placed somewhere warm to speed up the time it takes. For me, I put it up in my 3D printing enclosure and set up a little heater with it. But even then, it took over two hours to etch all the way through the brass. When I took it out, I used some baking soda to neutralize the acid still on the brass sheet, and then just some water to clean the rest off. The rest of the acid can be stored and reused many times. Honestly, this isn't bad for a first attempt at this. I'll definitely have to come up with more designs in the future. Now, these are very sturdy plants compared to the paper counterparts, but I can see why they're expensive to buy. The process is a lot more involved than the paper ones. All right, with the plants figured out, let's make some trees. And when I said I wanted trees, I mostly wanted to improve on my previous attempt at making these. I wanted big, lush, old forest trees with detailed trunks. In order to accomplish that, we're going to be sculpting them out of polymer clay, which I've also never used before. Are you seeing a bit of a trend here? Anyways, I start with a wire armature so that the clay has something to stick to. This is just a set of thin gauge wires twisted around and split off at various places. After the clay is properly kneaded, I roll out little sausages to go around the trunk and make sure to get some even coverage so that no wire is showing at the bottom. I then take various sculpting tools, which is really just a bunch of metal sticks with various types of points, and carve in some wood-like patterns in the tree. This really didn't take much time at all and was rather kind of fun. Reminds me of playing with Play-Doh as a kid. Now the instructions say to shove this in the oven for 15 minutes on low heat to cure, but I don't think my wife would appreciate the noxious fumes this releases in our food oven. So this old toaster oven will have to do. After I did this, Tinu from Craftastrophe told me that I probably need to cover the sculpt in some foil so it doesn't burn like this. Thanks Tinu, that's an excellent idea. But yeah, I think they came out pretty good. My second one wasn't even as burned up at the top thanks to the aluminum foil. And to give these trees a bit more height and some finer branches, I went outside and actually got some branches. These are from a pine hedge, which seems to have lots of splits in the wood at a smaller scale, which is perfect for miniatures. Now these essentially dry twigs are a lot more brittle than the wire armature I made, so to give them a bit of strength, I tied a bunch of them together and glued them to form these sort of stick bunches. They get grafted onto the bigger trunks where the wire connections end. I mostly use super glue as well as some UV resin to make the connections a bit stronger. 
and then plastered on some filler to hide the seams. In order to help me come up with a good paint scheme for the forest itself, I wanted to make sure it would be cohesive and go well with the miniatures that would inhabit it. To decide the color palette, I'm going to be leaning on an idea that one of you commented on for my Rapunzel Tower build, and that is using Disney movies as an inspiration for color. They've got teams of talented artists and colorists that work tirelessly to get the best color palette for their movies, so why not leverage some of that in our own art? For this, I took inspiration from the great map paintings of the movie Pocahontas. This is a classic, and if you comb through the footage, you'll notice something odd. There's rarely a scene where you see a brown bark and idyllic forest colors. It's all leaning into dark blues, purples, and everything is sort of tinted in this otherworldly color. I exported a screen grab from the movie and imported it into the website Coolors, which gives you a nice palette to work from. After printing it out, I set about color matching my own paints to match the painted up Lord of the Grove with this palette. The warm reddish brown and slightly purplish tan are going to be dominant on the miniature, but almost non-existent in the environment, which will primarily be blue, green, and teal, like in this scene. As I was painting these, I also got an idea forming. Why would this mythical centaur lord be guarding the forest? Well, we need some sort of MacGuffin that adventurers would be seeking to exploit. That's when I thought of the Fountain of Life. This would be some sort of magical statue with cupped hands, which when due forms in this particular clearing, harnesses the essence of the forest magic into a potent magical elixir. I kitbashed this model digitally from several free sculpts, including this bust of Sappho by Emmanuel Villanes. Sorry for butchering that. I added various organic shapes such as mushrooms, flowers, and leaves to make this look like an overgrown statue in the woods, and then set about printing it in resin. And I don't think I supported the head properly since I had a bit of tearing here, but this works in our favor since I can carve away some of these sections and fill in some gaps to make it look like the statue has been worn away by time and chipped away. I'm doing a very exaggerated paint scheme on this because it's going to be sort of a focal point of any layout, an objective to seek out. That means very strong contrast from dark to light, as if the clearing opens up just enough to shine a spotlight on it from above. To get this effect, I use some very diluted washes to tint all the crevices dark while keeping the flatter surfaces almost pristine white. While planning out the bases for the trees, I had envisioned the statue being integrated into one of them but I wasn't quite sure how it was all going to come together. So that I wouldn't be paralyzed by making a decision, I decided to just continue on and cut out several bases out of this final tile, which I end up using a lot of in my dioramas and terrain. I like it since it's flexible and waterproof, so any plaster and goops I add don't soak into it as much as they would on something like MDF or wood. In order to have something to place on the bases other than the trees and bushes, I treated myself to some new Woodland Scenics rock molds. I've made some similar rock molds before by just using crumpled up aluminum foil, but the detail you get from the molds like this is unmatched. They're a bit pricey, but I plan on getting a lot of use out of them for my project, so I felt it was worth it. Once dry, I'm able to break apart the rocks and arrange them onto my bases in a natural way. Just with a bit of hot glue here and there to tack them in while I work with them, and a layer of PVA and more plaster filler to really hold them in long term. Once the plaster was mostly dry, it was time to unify all the materials a bit more. So I took all my existing work and primed it in a rather strange color, teal. Remember our Pocahontas color palette? Well, this would make a great base for the following layers, I thought. Once primed, I gave the ground a bit more character by adding PVA glue and flocking it with coconut fibers from the pet store. This will get slightly tinted later, but still maintain its natural look, as we didn't cover it with the initial layer of thick primer. It's now time to make the tree canopy, and for the size of the trees I'm making, I wanted a rather cheap and bulk solution. Buying flock and foliage from hobby stores is quite expensive, and while it looks great, it's not always a good solution for large projects like this. So let's try making our own clumpy foam flock. I have some of this bendy foam type packing material. And I think it's the same stuff that pool noodles are made from. I cubed up a bunch of it and tossed it in a coffee grinder. And this actually ends up looking really good as fluffy foliage.
Let's see how it goes on the tree. With some spray adhesive, I can dip the branches in and get some good volume. It takes a lot of back and forth to build up more and more of it, but the process is worth it. It seems like I vastly underestimated how much I would need. So it's time to cut some more so it would fill out all of my trees. Once that was done, you can see here I'm testing out the layout a bit. I even repurposed some older trees I've made to serve as sort of saplings and give some variety. Nature isn't going to look all the same, so you always need to introduce some sort of variation. I realized at this point that gluing the trees down wouldn't really cut it, so I ended up drilling some holes from underneath and fixing the trunks in place with some longer screws. That way you can pick these up by the tree trunks and it won't come loose. I took care to blend in the roots with more coconut fibers and PVA glue here, making it all look like it belonged. Now that the trees were in place, I did another pass at some highlights with an airbrush. So blend in the coconut fibers with the trees and rocks a bit better. And to keep all the foam from shedding like crazy, I did a pass of spray sealing everything with some watered down PVA glue. After this dries overnight, it's going to give everything a lot more strength. Planning on adding a lot more fine flocks to the top of the trees, but in order to get a better overall color on the leaves, I took these outside and sprayed various vibrant colors on the black foam to give it more character. To flock the highlights, I'm using more spray adhesive. This time the stronger stuff. And dusting various colors of sawdust flock and foam flock from above with a sieve. This gives a very natural looking highlight to the trees and makes a huge mess to boot. More spray sealing to keep these from shedding and on we go. Do you remember those plants we worked on at the very start of the video? Well, time to bring those out and place them on. Once again, variety is the name of the game here. I added all the different types of paper plants, plastic plants, and even the brass etched vines. It was a great way of making this look like a fantastical, magical forest that it is. I even took the time to add these plants into the Fountain of Life statue. I love how this is turning out so far. But I did want to mute down some of the bright plasticky colors, so I sprayed everything with a dark blue craft paint through the airbrush. This slightly desaturates and tints everything to look more consistent, as the paint is very opaque. And finally, to give the fountain of life its life-giving waters, I ironically poured in some extremely toxic UV resin and cured it with a UV light. Probably not advisable to drink this, and I doubt it'll give you any magical powers. But hitting that subscribe button probably will. And with that, I want to thank you for tuning into this video and hope you enjoy these finished shots of the whole project. I'll catch you on the next one. See you around.